And off we go. Okay, so welcome to this talk about under attack. Uh, it's sort of a catch-all thing about all things security related um, in Drupal and outside of Drupal. Um, most of us are probably security conscious when it comes to our modules and code. But what I also want to bring to the surface today in this panel format is security at the level of our servers, at the network level, you know, DOS attacks, um, and defacing of our websites things. And I just want to sort of collect war stories of what we've experienced and what we've done about and sort of figure out, you know, what we're, what are people doing? I think there's way too little about these other parts of security that are outside the Drupal code that is being discussed in our community. And yet, at the end of the day, we're going to be responsible for much of it because we are the web guys. And we are, we are supposed to know, or we're assumed to know, and clients or our employers, or whatever the case may be, have no idea, really, who else to turn to. So uh, we're making this a panel session. Um, so let's get started uh, first by introducing ourselves, and then I'll set the stage a little bit. Um, my name is Christoph Weber. I work at BizX. Um, we own a bunch of um, portal websites. Rich, do you want to join us here? We're short one person. <laughs> I wish I had that look I on know. my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think she... Okay. So, um, I've previously I worked at SageTree. I've done a whole bunch of larger websites. And as you'll see in my slides before we go into the more panel part, We've been under attack multiple times at BizX, and we deal with things on a regular basis. So, Carl. My name is Carl. Uh, I've been Drupal for about six years. Um, I'm a co-founder of Top Shelf Modules. I've worked at SageTree and launched a lot of large-scale Drupal sites, so I've seen a lot of different kinds of attack vectors. I've worked at Acquia, I've worked at Qualcomm, and seen what kind of stuff people try and pull off. I'm Zach Huber. I work with Christoph at Physics now. Um, I also got to see a lot of the crazy stuff um, that made him come up with this panel idea, and I think it's a great idea. And um, yeah, not super knowledgeable compared to him probably, but um, definitely um, feel like I can shed some light on a few things that are really simple to do. Hey everybody, um, my name's Rich. Uh, my company is Sage Tree. We miss Christoph. <laughs> um, at BizX now, um, and uh, we've done you know uh, just you know basically what, what Christoph said. You know we've, we've done a number of sites, and we've seen how how they can get hacked and how they can get attacked. And it's really all quite interesting and quite frustrating while you're in the middle of it, hair raising. But you know, it's uh, all good stuff. All right, so let me, let's me let lead off with some examples to set the stage. We get to see a lot of those on our sites. In fact, pretty much all <laughs> of our sites, you know, people are trying to log in all the time, and sometimes they're successful and are creating accounts. That's the sort of easier part. Our editors can deal with that. They will delete the spammy users that they don't want in uh, things. So that's, that's the easy part. Here's a more scary part. That's one that my colleague Stephen found. He said, since when do we have Arab note titles? And then we <laughs> looked, um, and we didn't actually display the note. That's a, that's a Drupal node, and it has a complete shell inside it. I think because it was a node and not PHP that was at the doc root level, it was sort of defanged to some extent. But we didn't trust it. We took it offline anyway. But this is, uh, this is pretty interesting stuff. If you scroll down on this page, here is more fun stuff that it purports to be doing. And I fully believe if you're on an unsecured server, it could do all of these things, take over your server, determine all of the bits and pieces, and determine for someone who is interested in your server what exactly is my next step because they're using Apache version X and they're using PHP 5.1 instead of 5.2 and blah, 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 you know and report that all back to the mothership. Do they got that on your site? Uh, I wish we did. <laughs> uh, no, actually we do. Um, the, one of our owner's uh, account was hacked and it was put in under his name. Oh, and he has administrative privileges on the site. If these guys knew what they were doing, they would have totally destroyed our sites. It's, uh, it, I think it was strip kitties, so we were lucky. So, you know, sort of just a few little war stories right here. So. Um, 
Let's turn it over to the panel. Um, what brought you? We talked a little bit about it, but let's go into more depth. What brought you here, Carl? Um, well, working with Rich at Sage Street, um, they launched ComicCon.org, which uh, is under attack fairly often. It's a really high traffic site. And uh, one of the most interesting things about it is when, I don't know how most of you are probably familiar with Comic-Con, San Diego. Uh, there's a ticket sale, and it starts at 9 a.m. on a certain time. And roughly 600,000 people around the world try to buy tickets. And, and they hit it in the same minute, 9, 0, 9 to 9.01. You're getting traffic from all over the world trying to log into the site and figure out what to do. So it looks like a distributed denial of service, but it's just their normal traffic pattern. Like it, it is uh, an insane flood that just comes through. And then there are people that try to actually attack it at the same time, either I think because they got in and they want to prevent other people from getting in, or they just think it's fun to crash the whole thing. But um, it was just a huge mess. And they warned us beforehand, and I didn't really believe them. I'd never seen traffic like that uh, in just such a tiny period of time. Um, and then I've worked at Acquia where uh, actually Acquia sites get hacked every once in a while. Um, not through anything that they do, not even, it's not a hosting problem, it's misconfiguration. It's a little too easy sometimes to configure Drupal and leave things open that can be exploited. Yeah. What about you guys? Yeah, I'm, I'm here basically for the same reason that Christoph's here, because I have a vested interest with a bunch of sites that have a lot of, um, maybe weren't configured correctly, and a lot of times weren't configured correctly uh, on the server level, as well as with Drupal permissions and um, within Drupal itself. And that lends itself to opening yourself up to attack. And then also, I saw I saw a story on Slashdot like a month or two ago that said um, DDoS attacks were up like exponentially in the in the last quarter year. So it just seems like they're not going anywhere, and it seems like it's going to be something that you need to know going forward. And it's just um, you need to know how to protect yourself and prevent it from happening, and not making yourself a target. So uh, I stepped into this uh, presentation because I wanted to pick up some some new best practices. I was talking to Christoph, he said it was going to be, you know, an open conversation. I, was, I wanted to come up and find some new best practices that we could bring into Sage Tree and make, you know, make our stuff better. So, mm -hmm. so, yeah, let's open it up to the crowd. What brought you into the session? What are you hoping to get out? And, you know, at any time, this is an open panel. If you have questions or something to contribute, feel free to raise your hand. This is not a us speaking to you type thing. It's us as a whole group, right? So what, what, what brought you here? Yes. I have one site, like a very small portfolio site, and uh, all of a sudden I have 300 users, and uh, the guy who owns the site, or who is my client, basically got a bunch of weird emails. And uh, so permissions, I closed down all the permissions for the anonymous users, and, all, and I left some of that configuration open. That's what I'm hoping was the problem, but I really don't know, you know, I just have like, uh, all these users have funny <coughs> names, and uh, they're spamming, <laughs> and, they, and they can um, uh, access the site-wide contact page. Mm -hmm. yeah. so I funny I names like those? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you have CAPTCHA and Mullen on? Uh, no, but that's ah. next. Uh, next yeah. Yes. So, I think, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you bring up a, a good thing, just as a as a kind of like common knowledge kind of thing, understand why why do people want to hack your site? Uh, usually, uh, I'd say ninety nine percent of the time, that when 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 I found a hack server, is they want to use it as a spam relay, and so that's when you uh, when your site like slows down and when you look at it and you see the mail processes going through the roof, um, and then uh, spam relay, and then also just SEO when they start just mm -hmm. building like. Thousands and thousands of nodes with all this Cialis and Viagra and. Uh, yeah, and remember, it's not a they. It's not like a, an intelligence uh, where somebody has like a mission in general. It's it's just the way these programs work. Because as Christoph said before, with the script kitty, a script kitty is just a guy who got a program who's trying it out. Uh, and so typically, they're they don't really have a mission. They're just going to wreck things. Oh yeah. And <laughs> so then they're and going get, to get become those, able yeah. as. as being a, a piece of hardware they can use for other things once it's been exploited. Um, but that's really when you're being targeted. So yeah, the first step on that is to use CAPTCHA, then MOLM, and then, then if it keeps happening, you know, then you look at the, you step it up a bit. 
But you brought up an important point, and that's permissions. I've been really big at work about permissions in your doc root. There's a beautiful script on dropbucket.org, which is a new um, Drupal sort of um, uh, repository of snippets. And so it has a script there that's called Drupal permissions.sh that has all the best practices in there. What should your web root be? What should your files directory be? So what you have to figure out is who is running PHP under which account? Uh, oh, actually, sorry, under which group? That group should have read permissions for your doc root. Um, and the owner of the doc root should be a innocuous account that's not Apache and not the PHP owner. It should be another owner like your deploy user or someone else. Hmm. Um, and again, that user does not necessarily need write permission, although you can give it. Um, you just have to worry about how you deploy code if you don't give write permission. And the rest of the world doesn't need any permissions whatsoever. And that's one of the biggest vectors that right there. Um, that script will take care of it once you have figured out what those owners and groups will be on your site, and you will set it right. And the only place that's really wide open is your public files directory. And even there, it's not world writable if you have it configured correctly, because Apache and PHP, or both, depending on how your site is configured, need to be able to write in there, but nobody else. And once you've got this locked down, you're a fair way into better security at the code level, or at the server code level. And, and that script really is, is a nice thing to take care of it for you. Yeah, I would say permissions are definitely something that, that's very important. Obviously, as we both know at this point, it's something that's really easy to misconfigure. But what I've also learned in recent, recent happenings is um, like it's not always Drupal or your file permissions. Um, a lot of times, it's like other third-party software that you may have installed and maybe didn't know how it was going to interact with things, like even the D.O. Uh, mishap mm -hmm. where usernames or passwords or whatever were compromised, it turned out that that actually wasn't even Drupal or anything like that. It was like a third-party software that somebody had installed. So like situations happen all the time where you set things up correctly, but you, maybe you install something for some specific functionality, and that has its own loopholes that you don't necessarily know about. So it's like you really have to be aware of what you've installed on your server, and like if it has any sort of loophole or, or um, like backdoor that, that opens up. Just right. scary. Which you can check with nmap. If you if you download nmap, you can scan all your ports and, and try and fingerprint what you're trying to attack. So you have to think like the hacker, cracker. You, you basically are attacking your own servers. And um, so to learn that, you can go out and make honeypots or whatever, but you can also go and look for the, guess what OS it is, and then try and attack it from that aspect and try and figure out the features that you want. That's what a script kiddies program is going to do. Mm -hmm. or a real hacker is going to do. And then what we do, like, so I do a bunch of stuff for Qualcomm, right? Everybody hates Qualcomm. I do. So, <laughs> so they, they, uh, they attack uh, there all the time, and so what we do is we use Netscalers at the BIP level and, like, basically cut off, like, admin and user and, you know, security through obfuscation, but we, we move those out or we make them non-accessible to the outside so that they can't go and um, attack That's those. at the firewall? Level? Basically, yeah. yeah. So we do a translation. It basically says um, when you hit it, it gives you a bunch of bunk IPs. You know, you have no idea where you're attacking. You know, oh. and they change. They they that's at a totally different level. You know, so you've got your enterprise level, and then you've got your common Drupal client level. You know, so but something like that, a bit or a trans like, you know, well, there's a like hundred ways to do that. But yeah. the NetScaler is just a fancy one. A really simple way, like in your HD access file, you can lock down URLs. And if you know that only internally you need to be able to access admin URLs, there's no reason you need to serve those out to the World Wide Web. Absolutely. And that's just stuff like 10 lines of code in HD access. Right. Yeah. But then they're going to go after your IPs. But yeah, that's but yeah. 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 A lot of the HD that's access story. stuff, like uh, I sent you those screenshots shots earlier, but basically, like stuff that you can do by default with Drupal, just simple HD access stuff, just to deny, like changelog.txt install.txt, readme.txt, anything that has um, information that the script kiddies are going to try and use. Like, it's, secure, it's security through obfuscation, like you mentioned. Basically, it's not going to protect you from anything, actually, but it will help prevent people from Just being able to tell. guessing. They yeah. might yeah. give up yeah. quick. Because a, a, a lot of the scripts go out there and they're looking to go, oh, it's, I'm looking for Drupal 6.27, <clears throat> and I know that there's a, a vulnerability with this module on this Drupal level or whatever. And then, so they look for those sites and they index them, and then they come back to them later, maybe. 
And so if you, with an HT access call that just basically says, or um, you know, a little if statement that says, um, if it's chain block, block it, then they, the script kiddies can't get it. They can't guess, they can't finger grip, because what they're looking for, just like you said, they're looking for a pattern that says this is Drupal. And then and they can guess version. it. Yeah, and then they go for the version, and then they figure out, oh, what's the, what the, the holes? what's the exploits that are available for this one? Mm -hmm. You know, that's why other ones like WordPress and Joomla and all these other, you know, like you said, if you install something else, you're you're creating this huge security hole for you for yourself because they're going, oh, well, Drupal's kind of hard. I'll go nail this other thing and make people look stupid, or you know, whatever they're <laughs> yeah. Um, like but like I noticed on another one, I just thought of was for the captcha and the Mollum deal. Uh, I saw a client and another consultancy like block everything with CAPTCHA and Mollum, but because they had secure certs and some other things with extra ports, they had multiple forms with the same forms that were coming through on different ports, so they got hacked on like 8080. So they got attacked through 8080 and like lost it anyway, even though they had everything else locked down. So that in mapping is really important. So in map now, you can do that with like, I think they have GUI tools for it nowadays, don't they? It, yeah. it used to be a shell tool, but I believe I've seen like in-map stuff, and you can poison and try and attack your own stuff, which makes it um, useful. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a question I want to put out to the, the folks here: um, a, lot, a lot of times, if you kind of like look at, well, if you look at logs, and you just find yourself looking at your logs, you can kind of see when people are kind of probing your site, you'll see a lot of hits from certain IPs that are like PHP my admin, PMA, uh, you know, slash, you know, WP admin, like those kind of kind of common URLs. And you'll see them coming from just like, you know, certain IPs. I was wondering if anybody had a solution so that kind of can monitor that and then proactively block those IPs once it detects that they're they're probing your site. Firewall, AC access, I use this thing called fail to ban. I was just, actually, I was going to ask you about my question. You guys are familiar with it and you're, you're, you're caught in it. But basically, <clears throat> to, to solve that problem, mm -hmm. basically, fail to ban just reads logs, your syslog, so, and you can have, you use regex to tell it what phrases to look for. So you just tell mm -hmm. it to look for failed logins, mm -hmm. and, or you tell it to look for, uh, I mean, I was sort of, my overkill is I, I have it look for pages that do not exist. So when the guy does that script that's like, yeah. He gets three or four tries. If he tries three or four times and he keeps looking for pages that do not exist, his IP just is banned for an hour. Yeah, that's that's nice. that, then he can do a couple of one hour from now. So I have little, it puts them in different jails for different amounts of times based on their, what their activity is. That's interesting. Some yeah. people think it's crazy, but it, for me it's not. No, actually, it's really nice because for me, in, in my mind, it solves two problems because once you're at that level, you're not going into PHP anymore from that guy, which means the load on your server goes down. Well, that's the reason I have to do exactly. the 404. And, yeah. and it probably will discourage the robot from trying again because those robots are smart enough to not try on targets that are not yielding anything for too long, although they try repeatedly uh, they're, because they're somewhat dumb, but they're not completely dumb. And they'll move on, so it's it's sort of it's all two things at once, but it, it keeps your server reasonably happy, which is a good thing. Um, one thing that that I also wanted to bring up is um, you know a lot of PCs get infected with, with and get zombified, but web servers also get zombified, and the reason is your web server has about a thousand times more bandwidth than your PC at home on your upload link. And so it's a really juicy target to make it a spam source. So it's not necessarily just to hack your site or deface it or to, um, to put in spammy comments and get SEO juice and stuff, but it's also because once they can take it over, they can just send a boatload of traffic out to the web until you find out that your bandwidth um, bill goes through the roof. Um, so that's why they're actually really juicy targeting because it's, they're awesome. From a, from a spammer's point of view. And the other thing I wanted to bring up that I've read up about recently is there are now CAPTCHA solving armies of low paid employees in China that basically get the robot goes through your site, grabs the CAPTCHA, displays it on the, on the Chinese desktop, and says solve that CAPTCHA for me, and then they hit return, and it goes back to the bot, and the bot puts it in your form, and they're in anyway. It's like, yeah. Amazon. That is sort of really scary in my mind. 
It's like you get humans employed who will work for 50 cents an hour in solving captures. Good question. No, it stops them before they before the server has to do any really like intense procedures. Yeah, you can give them all kinds of different responses depending on how you do it. You could literally say like send them someplace else. I mean, um, there's all kinds of things you or send them to a page that is static and and doesn't have. But she's talking about the Drupal internal IP blocking. Oh, okay. So, I'm not sure. I use that. It doesn't give any. It says that it just it just gives a blank screen if somebody's trying to get in. You're still getting into PHP, but it's very early in the Drupal Bootstrap process. So it's uh, it's light on your server, but not super light. And my um, thing would be to sort of um, you know be being responsible for some high-profile servers. It's a great level of first uh, defense, but once I have a whole bunch of numbers, I probably want to transfer those uh, to, to the server level, to Apache, so that um, very early in the stack, we ban those so that they're cheap. You don't even at all. Yeah, and hopefully at the firewall, so that it doesn't even hit my server, but that the firewall just says, you're out. Um, so sort of a graduated response, but I mean, it's really cheap to do it in Drupal. It's quick, and it's a great first thing, but I, if you have the capacity, I would move it back into an, on the stack to as early as you can. That's a great, that's a better solution, but sort of in between those two, there's a module, I think it's called uh, IP Ranges, that I use on a political site, I was getting a lot of bogus registrations from overseas, uh, many per day, uh, that were auto-blocked, and I, I set it up that way, uh, but it's annoying. So I started going, who is this on those IP addresses? And if it was in Beijing or in Eastern Europe, I would look for the entire range assigned to that uh, and, and just block that. With it, by doing that in a day or two, uh, my traffic went to nothing. Is it 56? I know there was 57. Oh, there's only seven. And remember, check out your AC access because if you if you stop them way before, like Christoph saying, yeah. you know you don't have the, one of your biggest enemies in performance <coughs> is your log file. It can be yeah. so Drupal sitting there, and if you don't ignore it, it's sending it to Watchdog every time. You can literally bring the freaking thing down if you don't do it. If you don't do <laughs> this stuff correctly, so if you can put that stuff into it, you can do a, a star pattern in AC access and basically do an entire range like you're talking about. And just block off all of Eastern Europe if you really wanted to. So, or wherever. I'm not being picky on them, but. <laughs> you know, China. Um, it's a US community site. We don't need any traffic from China or Eastern Europe. Yeah, and we have that same thing at work, too, where we're sort of focused on mostly North American clients. And then the thing is, we don't need traffic from China because those guys, when we have referrals to our affiliates, those, if those referrals are worthless. We're basically charging our affiliates for stuff that isn't good for them anyway. We might as well just cut them off at the source. Good point. Question? Yeah, we have a corporate site, and one of the kind of curiosities that I have is we have files that are only used in Uh, life cycle. 
still be life cycle. It'd be. Yeah. 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 I wrote a module for life cycle and extract. And so it's in my sandbox. Right now we use TCP, uh, but I don't know that it's possible to use TCP to generate. Uh, no. I don't think that's this is all VRM based, it's user based, it's user, user specific, so you can set how long it takes to check in. Think of it like iTunes, but like worse. Okay. Where it's like, you can set like a week, but I'm a big VRM guy, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can have this corporate secrets PDF that they, you know. Yeah, and you can go check who's, who's viewing it. And you can get rid of the lease and explode it. So basically it's no good to anyone. Oh, wow. Yeah, and then you can tell who's checking it on it. Okay. So if he goes out and gives his password out to 20 other people and shares that company secret. And your life cycle does that by default. Yeah, well, by purchase. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I don't know what it costs. I don't pay the bill. Okay. Okay. Well, that's, that's really useful information. Yeah, thank you. Um, just so you know, uh, having done the number of security meetups, basically all your social media yeah, I mean, there's not. If they have a breach, it's because they have information that people will care about. <coughs> so, no matter how hard you try, but it's, it's the best effort. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm giving you the best effort shot. You know, yeah. of course, nothing's perfect. So when we go to court, I want to make sure that you know, well, we're doing these things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because that's the that's the whole point. Yeah, we we, we try. Been hacked anyway. We, we track everything, so we use a thing called uh, SiteMinder, it's uh, computer associates, so everybody, we have no anonymous traffic ever, we use a, uh, you can use a module called no anon, it's really more for performance, no, no anonymous, but like, kind of crazy for a guy who loves performance, but we, literally everybody using any of our sites are always authenticated 100% of the time, and on top of that they do a SiteMinder, uh, it, grabs a header, it passes it to LDAP, LDAP answers it back, says this guy has the rights, we have all these Drupal modules that work with that, and then therefore we're watching you all the time, what you're doing, what you're taking, what you're downloading. It's fairly ridiculous, but it, it's a, that's a whole like big brother, we can do it. <laughs> you can't yeah. 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 I mean, I know ways to like modify my cookie and you know become somebody else, but uh, you know, you've gotta really wanna try, you gotta know what that is, but legally, you know, making the lawyers and the courts happy, that's the whole, that's the whole stack. Yeah, I think that's an important, but that's an important concept because there's this sort of the engineering approach. Can it be hacked? Yes. Will it be hacked? Yes. But then there's the sort of the, 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 the legal thing. Do you have plausible defensibility because you did all the right thing? Will it stand up in court? Hopefully so. That's a whole nother thing. That's, that's not an engineering question. But it's, did you do the best possible so that you can say, hey, yeah, we're, you know, it's best practices, so we're, we should be good. If it gets breached, to, you know, Se shit happens. Yeah, security, like, you go to all the, uh, you know, was yeah. it, um, TourCon and, like, the big DEF cons and all that. The idea behind a lot of the security black hat, white hat, is that the white hats are always, we think of ourselves as smart, smarter than the black hats. The people that are running around being script kiddies all day are, are the bad guys. And you know we're always going to be one step ahead of them type thing. So when you have that guy who's trying to do what you're talking about doing, maybe he's not as intelligent as the person who's actually trying to uh, really get him. Yeah. So um, that's kind of the ideology that's behind that. You know, like that's the way I've always been taught. Yeah, I mean we just figured that he's probably going to get away with sneaking in passwords that he has to get out. So yeah. I just figured there's got to be some simple way of tracking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We used to use honeypots to to gather that. So. We would set up ways for them to authenticate in order to get through that would be a separate authentication that would eventually get them to identify themselves. So you set up traps. You basically say, oh, he's logging in this way, change it. And then get him to finally authenticate some other way that he actually gives you some form of real information. You know, one thing, wow. the insider threat is probably the largest threat that we're going to encounter. So if the insiders know that they're being watched and monitored, they're going to reduce that threat significantly. Just knowing that. That's true. Insider threats are typically bigger. I mean, 
your employee leaving on bad terms and uh, from home logging in through their VPN account or whatever and doing an RF uh, minus R, RM minus RFs on the root of your more, most important server. I've been there once. <laughs> Not funny. I mean, yeah. If you want to get really, really bad, um, I can give you a whole list of names of software that they use to track people. Yeah, so I, I don't have them on out of my head, but I just went to like four classes where they're literally watching desktops and yeah, I mean, every I little file. I don't mean to be NSA. No, no, but I mean, <laughs> that's a, you know, you like monsters. The, the stuff that's actually there is pretty insane. It's, they won't touch my computer, but yeah. Okay, where you going? We had a question over here. I have a question on a totally different level of security, but just talking about this screenshot right here. Um, without knowing or taking any of those, you know, security steps from the server level or however you guys do that, uh, basically what's, what you, are you guys saying is that you can't, this can't be stopped without those? Like, like Molem and, and, and all the other CAPTCHA and modules and recaptcha doesn't necessarily work since these scripts that people are running just bypass those in the first place? Well, it makes the... The barrier towards accessing your percent compromised percent a lot higher. So it's you know, if somebody is motivated enough, they're they're going to find a way into your site. But you just raise that barrier towards entry. Because technologies. I mean, I'm the one who took the screenshot, but uh, like there's you know Molem and recapture and capture and all those things, but people, as you can tell, still you know get in there. So it's like, how do you stop that? Can you stop that? Well, you don't have to let people register for yeah. accounts on your site. So yeah, you really have to think about, like a lot of people, everyone has user, uh, slash user enabled by default, like that's just Drupal. So like you have to really think about, do you want users on your site? Like is it, is it a community site or is it really just like someone's branding site, like where they're just trying to establish brand identity? Like if you don't want people registering, you just disable. But, slash if, but if you did. But if you did, then you just need to understand that it comes with um, people that are going to try and that's the company. You can also yeah. you can start accounts as blocked until the admin has approved them. So that that prevents them from actually logging in, even though they can generate some account information. That should be set as default. Yeah, yeah mostly. But their Drupal starts off pretty open. There's a lot of things you can do that may leave holes that people can walk right in. Uh, I see a lot of sites with slash node. Uh, it comes with Drupal, and it just has a list of every node that's on the site. And hopefully, it's nothing you didn't want people to know about. Um, so, like disabling stuff like that really helps locking down the user accounts. Um, the PHP filter we finally got a hold of, but it, in Drupal five and six, it, it was easy enough to give somebody the PHP access that they shouldn't have, or full HTML even can be dangerous enough. Um, that was the site at, at Acquia where we couldn't figure out how they had installed the script. It was another one like you had coming up there where. We could read the code. We saw that it like did all this diagnostics. It downloaded all these packages. It was really advanced, and it turned out that the company had had a contest, and for your uh, one text area, they had themed away everything around it, but it was full HTML, so mm -hmm. it was allowing script tags through. So they could basically enter whatever they wanted, and then as soon as they viewed it, it caused the server to download software and compromise the whole site. Yeah. The script yeah. in the it took us forever to find because they didn't say full HTML anywhere. But yeah. things like that can can bring your site down quickly. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. even more dangerous when you have um, the module that allows you to enter PHP code into WYSIWYG, and then mm -hmm. like if someone gets user access to that, if you have sites that that use that, you know, on like a, like a body field, which I've seen and Chris has seen, it's like. That's super dangerous when. Yeah, you should get rid of that immediately. <laughs> yeah, totally. no, seriously. Yeah. Like that, that, it's like the worst thing. Huge, and every company I work at, it's a minimum security baseline. PHP filter is off. Yeah. yeah. You, it's removed. There's a patch to remove it from core. Mm -hmm. So you, you that way, anybody who, who figures out how to put a module into your site that's even on your team in order to use that, because you just want to be lazy and enter PHP, um, instead of putting in a module or a theme or whatever. Because, um, you know, you could get username and password for that thing. Uh, just it's insanely and it's insanely bad <laughs> and you can't and another thing on a performance level you cannot cache that data you cannot cache that yeah, because yeah, it's, it's, it's dynamic so you're you're killing your you know it's in the database like that mm -hmm. yeah and well, yeah, I'm like, well, I can work on a site like that 
<laughs> and yeah, the other thing yeah. that's hard to track is like you know, it doesn't get logged. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah it just gets sure. executed, doesn't get logged, and it doesn't leave any traces. It's really yeah. trying to figure out where it's coming from. Right. You don't know, yeah, they're definitely going to check the features. Like yeah. <laughs> it, it just gets database. really, yeah. really ugly with those salvage sites, right, where you have PHP in views, you have PHP in the database and nodes, you have PHP that doesn't play with Drupal but gets called through some includes, and then the Drupal's own PHP. And it's like, where the heck is what happening? It's, it's even hard to just maintain such a site, yeah. much less that it's just totally insecure because... The, the kitties don't care where your PHP runs. Once they find the hole, they'll exploit it, or their scripts will exploit it. And so it's, uh, yeah, that's that's a that's a bottomless pit. Do you guys know of a good? Because um, they used to do this all the time, and I kind of dropped out of it. A good like you got a you got a site, it's handed over to you. You're like, oh, it looks fine. You don't have time to go through that thing. <laughs> you do a little bit of code review, but those like so side eye. Remember, they used to have some things that would run through, look for certain stuff. Anybody know a good side auditing tools for Drupal? There's security audit module that does a fairly decent first pass on those things. And it will surface PHP in your views, and it will surface PHP in nodes. And uh, it will also surface permissions that are weird or not great practice. And it will surface that your uh, you know, PHP filters on, mm. stuff like that. Uh, so it, it does a fairly decent first pass. I use the hack module a lot. Yeah, that yeah. is is. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it doesn't tell you like if somebody's attacked your site, but it tells you if any of the code has been <clears throat> modified from the yeah, release version. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So you can you can quickly see like oh there's been a change or a new file that doesn't belong here. Um, and most security problem I'd say many are in in custom code like stuff that's on Drupal.org gets a lot of eyeballs. Like, there are security problems found periodically, but it's custom stuff where you really have to pay attention. It's pretty easy to not sanitize a form input or a yeah. field somewhere, and then somebody can put a script tag in that you didn't expect. Or... Then use the private file system. Um, and use the, private. Yeah. Drupal 7, it's good. It is insanely good for security. Um, because you can, you know how you can see your file paths, like your, your doc? Like, you can, a lot of cases, you can just guess where that file path is and go get that file. Um, people would be surprised what you can do to actually get a hold of those files, like PDFs or so forth, so on. Uh, there's lots of techniques. So with the private file system in Drupal, you you can't. We literally, mm -hmm. we, have, uh, we have really, really IP heavy videos, and so we protect them with the private file system. It's quite useful. It's really ingenious. For anyone that doesn't know, it, it basically makes the <coughs> the path to the file, it's fake. So it comes in as a request to the server and then Drupal gets to fully bootstrap and check everything it wants to check and if everything goes well, then it serves the file. But it's not a direct path on the server. Whereas with the public file system, you may or may not know all of that is public if you know the URL. Yeah, and it's a lot of extra work to protect it. And in Drupal 6, you could go either or, but in Drupal 7, you can use both. Actually, Drupal time. 6 probably is pretty broken. It pretty much does not work. <laughs> um, you can get it to work, but it's a lot of yeah, extra. Yeah. So, but in seven they fixed it, so now you can lock stuff down pretty well there. Is that an easy transition to go from that public files folder to? The Depends file. on your use case. So it's how, how complex you know your system is. Like we we are getting it to work right with what we were doing. Yeah, it was incredibly difficult, but it would have been way more difficult without it being there. So if you're just like flipping some files from one to the other, no, it's not hard. Yeah. Okay. What are we doing? <laughs> I mean, you need a module, I think, to set up some kind of access check. By default, I don't think Drupal actually checks anything. It just locks the padding. Yeah. Well, it locks it and, and does the whole bootstrap. Yeah. But yeah. something yeah. actually has to do hook uh, file access or something. And you so you can download a module. There's plenty of contrib modules that give that to you, or you can implement your own security system. And so Uh, it's not super obfuscated. It's like slash private slash sites default files. Um, but it's, it does the job. And it also puts an HG access in that folder. So like Apache will not serve anything out of that directly. And the only access is going to be through Drupal then. 
or of your server gets compromised. Meaning you are trading server performance for security. Yes. So the minus is Drupal has to bootstrap on every one of those requests. Oh, man. So and it will not service through Varnish ever. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So if you're storing, like, your sprites or your image assets for your theme, it's probably not. Yeah. Yeah, you will. <laughs> yeah. I'm talking about user-contributed yeah. files. Yeah. Well, that yeah. was the problem with 6 was everything got switched over to private, so you were serving your CSS, your JavaScript, your images, and so every single request, and there could be hundreds for a single page, was getting open Drupal Bootstrap to see if it was I mean, okay. there's ways, there's definitely ways around what they're talking about. Yeah. I mean, you, you could change your front end, and you can change how it, how it gets into it. That's a lot of... The, yeah. Yeah, you could do it. There were some blog posts about it. Yeah, you can make it super fast. Yeah. Do you have another question? Kind of a, a broad question here, but maybe we could talk a little I know it was a really minor one that I saw today when I was looking up the HT Access stuff. Like, um, they're going to move all the, well, this is, I saw this for eight. I don't know. I haven't verified it myself. But someone created an issue in the issue queue for um, putting all of those documents that I talked about, the text documents that have all the version info, putting them into a folder called Docs inside of Core. So, like, you don't have readme, uh, changelog, install, dot text, like, all showing all this information. So then the HT Access rule would just say, you know, deny on this, on this, this folder called docs. So that's, again, that's just like obfuscation, like hiding your version info. It's not a huge improvement from a, from a infrastructure standpoint, but it's a small win. You know, it's good that we're moving that I'd, direction. I'd say the configuration management will help a lot too. Um, so now we store a lot of configuration in files. And if you have your permissions set properly, those files should not be changeable or editable <coughs> or hopefully readable by the wrong people. Whereas before, that was all in the database, so if somebody could figure out a way to get into that, it was pretty easy to modify stuff. Like, once they were in the database, all bets were off. And that also means that if your database does get hacked, you have a way to go back to the last intended uh, stat state of your site from the config files in DA. Mm -hmm. Probably with a bit of help from whatever, custom modules and custom code, at least initially, but you have two ways where it's recorded in the database and in the YAML files. So, and plus, you will hopefully have that in Git, so you can basically restore your site from Git and, and reconfigure the database from there. Um, and, and you'd be good to go without having a, 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 to deal with database dumps uh, because it's content only now. Yeah, so um, we haven't talked about DOS much, but so I'm, I'm curious, you know, we sometimes look at those and we see the traffic coming in, we sort of say, hmm, shoot, uh, what to do next? We can look at our router and we can gather some info from it, unless the router is also overwhelmed at that point and then we essentially can do nothing. So I'm curious what other people have done. Pray. <laughs> <laughs> yeah multiple IPs to switch the routers across the board so you cut one arm off and cut the others, but you got to be big enough to do that. Right. What about people who use like something like Tor or some sort of IP spoofing yeah, you mechanism? Yeah, do that as well, or if you were using CDN type, you know, your Akamai, you can do the same thing. It's all the same ideas, like, they're attacking here, move it, mm -hmm. you know. And they, this is an up, you know, fire that thing up. It's just set in reserve. I mean, for things like you guys are doing with Comic Con, that's what you do. We, there's a lot of things we would have liked to do, uh, <laughs> but there were reasons why that couldn't happen. Yeah. yeah. And we you know we had no idea going in just how bad it would be. And I mean, I swore that it would not go down under my watch, and I left the scene with my tail between my legs. It was pretty humbling. <laughs> 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 No, it didn't really it go down. Slow, it just right? was, it got really it was slow. inaccessible for minutes at a time. Yeah. yeah, no, it didn't really crash. So I guess it's a matter of definition, but it was still humbling, quite frankly. Well, and you mentioned logging earlier. Like, that was one of the first things that yeah. went down. On, yeah, you can't on that. do that. Yeah. The database just writes uh, way too much. Yeah, well, all those requests are coming in, all the errors are coming in. Like, there's and no, it, it, no, it, no it, none of the database. You've got to figure the logging becomes useless. useless. When yeah. you start getting yeah. that yeah. heavy, you're just like... <clears throat> Well, we were using syslog and not dblog module. Yeah. I mean, that's a given on a high-traffic site, but even then, it was rough. Yeah, so like, 
for people that aren't following that, if you have a production site where you have the DB logs enabled, so Drupal's logging everything in the database, um, disable that just because if people hit it or if they're hitting 404 pages, it's just going to... Right, and one of the first that. things you should do with that is the, the snippet that they have in settings. There's actually a snippet. I think it's in 7 now, but it used to be in um, Press Flow in 6. Mm -hmm. And it was the what to do with 404s, 301s, like all this... Like, and JPEGs, PNGs, mm -hmm. when, when, don't, so Drupal loves to log everything. It's yeah. a chatty little monster, and it just, like, sits there <laughs> and logs everything in there. So it's like, oh, you wanted to look at a JPEG. Well, there you go. There's a JPEG, and it logs that. Well, you put, you turn that snippet on it, it ignores it. So it's one of the basic things you should do is turn that, make that off. Plus the, if you're using the no anonymous, if you're all in, yeah. interested in the authenticated, and the varnish, the ingenix, the... We didn't even bring that up at all. Well, it's talking important. about DDoS, you quickly turn into performance. Like, you need to outperform the number of requests coming in, either by reducing the number of requests that are spurious or by being able to serve them all or give them something. Right. Or, One of the things we saw there was, you know, stuff similar to what's up on screen, um, sort of semi-random paths that were requested. So none of these were cached in Varnish or anywhere else. And so each of them required a full Drupal bootstrap only to find out, well, we don't have that because people tried to find random hidden information on the site, how they could get a ticket, despite the fact that the ticket sales site, which was separate, was not serving up anything anymore. So that was the big one that hit us by surprise. That was super costly in Drupal and in the database. And um, I still don't know of any automated ways of getting rid of such traffic uh, in a meaningful way. We learned a bunch of patterns after the fact, and we were, you know, filtering for those to not let that hit. The, but beforehand, it was basically unknowable for us, mm -hmm. uh, unless people are a whole lot smarter than us and have, have things at the ready. But I'd, I'd be curious to learn what people know. Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, that's what we so did we after the fact. We were basically monitoring the logs and blocking IPs as they were, but the flood of traffic was just too much. It was. Just, <laughs> I mean, it was a lot. The screens were just scrolling by. There's just one thing um, for that specific purpose that, uh, <laughs> yeah. that someone showed to called if top. And basically does the same thing. It's like running top, but instead of processes, you're looking at traffic. So like if one IP is getting hammered, you'll see that. Or if one IP is hammering you, like yeah, it'll rise to the top. So that's super useful for that. Because it's, it's like this guy is, this is the asshole right here. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of here. Go, yeah. Go home. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, that's useful. Yeah, if top is, is pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I've always seen in the past where you have like a really dynamic site that would get attacked over time and you get all these bad URLs and you do all those things I mentioned in the settings and everywhere else and block all this useless traffic and logging. But your site almost starts to become static at that point. You start to go, I, I saw it with Mattel, like they would, they would literally record all the URLs that were real mm -hmm. and completely disassociate from any other ones. So it's almost like you've, you've gone back to like circa 1980, you know, yeah. and, and, and like... Yeah, a whitelist, that's it. And, and <laughs> you know, but that that's sometimes what you need for something like what you guys are doing. Yeah. yeah. You know, when you're doing it. So, like, same thing with, like, say, Apple. Apple has, like, one day that they announce a product. It's a free launch. They get attacked. I mean, it's got to be more popular. Like yeah. huh? Oh, yeah. It looks like an attack. It looks like an attack, but it's a lot of it's, Yeah, and they do a lot of it with Akamai. So they just switch uh, where things are going, where they're landing, hmm. um, what they deliver back. Uh, if you ever watch their site, you'll just see the Akamai, like where all the paths mm -hmm. change. It's interesting. <laughs> Do you have a question in the back there? Well, I was just wondering, there's nothing out there that would treat it not maybe like a blacklist or a whitelist, but like, you know, sort of a gray list where you have sort of like criteria that's suspicious. This IP is coming from China, it's hit the site multiple times. Let's route them over to the other server, you know, and as it's coming in, be able to like on the fly push some of that extra traffic over. Somewhere else that's going to give them a page to go, hey, you know, I mean, without saying you're suspicious, here's some extra hoops for you to jump through. All the other traffic that's, you know, maybe hit it once cleanly and all that, that goes through your main site. There's, like, there's no, no functionality like that to be able to start offloading that bad traffic, gray traffic. I'm pretty sure one could build those tools. 
But I mean, at this point, to my knowledge, we're talking building it ourselves. Uh, but I'm pretty sure other people have built similar stuff. So like, you know, you could simply say, if on if top you're rising to into the top three and your account is higher than X, then yeah, then we're rerouting you. So, it, I mean, you, you could totally script this up, I'm sure. The question is, you know, are there more generalized cases where people have done this already so that you could just dump in some sort of smart piece of software that does it for you and protects you from most of the nefarious stuff without you having to worry? But here's the problem for that uh, that I see is if you don't have unlimited bandwidth, you're still going to be dinged for the bandwidth coming into your server. Um, Regardless of what you do with the traffic, you may not be serving them out a whole lot of stuff, but you still get the requests, and it's go still going to be a ton of bandwidth. Yeah. There are DNS services, though, that you can switch, that you actually pay the DNS service. You go with a certain DNS service, they can stop at the DNS level and send them elsewhere. Uh, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and they'll, they'll reassociate certain IPs with other DNS providers and send them someplace else. Therefore, they stop them at that level. So we haven't wow. talked about hosts and DNS at all, but... Like you're saying, there are there are hosts that are more experienced dealing with these kinds of things, and they can monitor their traffic real time and see what's happening on their pipes before it even reaches your boxes and servers. Yeah. So if you're really That's concerned about it, pay yeah. a lot more money, and yeah. those are features available. Yeah, I don't think it was that. It, it's, as far as I remember, it wasn't. I mean, there's all different levels and tiers, but the ones that we were looking at at the time weren't that. Weren't That's that pretty bad. cool. Yeah. That's That's nice. Send it to the big bucket before it hurts. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, but basically, if there's services out there, <coughs> companies that are doing this on the common network, in terms of uh, denial of service um, carrying those, then you can hire them to help you out. So this stuff you actually want to stop in the network before it actually hits your service. Yeah. And so it's like a lot of times you're, you have to work with your network service provider. You know, some of the ISPs are really good. And as I said, there's also companies that just make money helping other companies deal with this. And I don't remember the names off the top of my head, but uh, right. And I mean, you know, like for probably at least half the people in the room, it's not a six hundred thousand hit, you know, site for Comic Con. It's like some, you know, like in my case, it's smaller sites, but somebody got, you know, some scripts going wild and pounding it with the denial of service thing for a while. I mean. I can't go to the client and say, hey, you have to spin up, you have to go through all these hoops. I mean, you know, we just... Well, I mean, you, know, so you, you start looking up with, like, you need to add, like, a car payment to things, right? And so there's things you can do using, like, you've actually got access to the full command box or whatever box. The stuff you can do with the firewall, where you can kind of make things like the firewall rules, probably. And say, okay, if this, uh, this thing happens, then add this to my firewall and restart my firewall. We need to do so you can do some of that custom stuff where you're pulling yeah, them down it's and it's stopping it's yourself. Yeah, so you have to have a dedicated server that you have control of. Correct. You have yeah. that control of, of that network interface of that server, whether it's a virtual server or not. Yeah. So it's possible to do that, you know, but there, I don't think... And another thing we might want to look at, and I don't know if anyone's used this, but ModSec, it's, it's a module, an Apache module, that actually is designed for security stuff, for example. Um, and I'm not sure how well the Drupal it works with Drupal because they haven't tried it, but for other stuff it works pretty well. You can have it in front of your Apache web server, and you can say, okay, this is the rules you're going to follow. And it's, um, it's actually a really nice model that does, and all these things will add weight to your server. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, and actually, it, it does work with Drupal. I have experience with it in one instance, <laughs> except that, of course, you will be looking at error logs on your mod set and figuring out the parts of your site that stopped working. So you might want to try that in staging first, um, because out of the box, it's really severe. Um, and we've done it with custom PHP sites that were done by grad students where, you know, their security was non-existent. So we, we had to sort of protect them at the front end because they got hacked all the time. Um, so it's it, it, it works actually fairly well in practice, even with Drupal. Uh, but you will need significant sysadmin time to get the right rule set figured out, and you know tight, le lessening the rules in some instances to do the right things for your Drupal site and its requirements. 
Yeah, it's on all over the board. So even if, if the Qualcomm, they don't let us touch a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But I'm just using them as an example because it's quite distributed. Um, we would get with the network engineers to need to do what we need. Uh, we even have a tough time getting API to Netscalers that are not ours. So, you know, and what Chris, what he's saying is absolutely true. Like uh, Apache modules in general can be quite uh, problematic when you start to lock this, when you actually flip those things on. It's like, <laughs> I, I love Apache, but you know, um, you might want to look elsewhere if you can. <laughs> Did you have a question way in the back there? Yeah, uh, to answer his question about how he's going to set up all this stuff, I did use Cloudflare, which does give you a free account, and their guarantee is to keep you updated with the ops. So even for the free account. So have you have you had it in practice? Um, I actually didn't sign up because I was getting DDoS, although I was. My air log was like bad, which I feel like kind of spam. Um, I was getting a ton of spam, yeah, like thousands of accounts, and then I had to delete them all. Pain in that. But I actually went because of the spam protection. They did cut down on the spam as well. But they are supposedly guaranteed. Did you get that through the Media Temple TV or? No, the Cloudflare, if you look them up, they. Oh, I know, yeah. Yeah, they offer a free account. Because uh, Cloudflare is All a, you do is pay the DNS. they're a direct partner with Media Temples VE and DV. No. So when you when you go with Media Temple DV distributed virtual, you get you, for twenty dollars extra for whatever plan you actually can get Cloudflare on yeah. that. That's pretty cool. I'm really glad this came up because I've been looking at Cloudflare for a while now for CDN purposes also, but then, you know, the they started as a security provider and then figured out what we built is actually CDN. And so they're now also marketing themselves as a CDN. Um, but I've never talked to somebody who actually had it in practice. So I've been sort of, I've kept it at semi arm's length. So good to, good to know. Yeah. So if you do the memo, like I would heavily not recommend anything needed to move below like the $50 range, the DB and the VE. Those are good. The GS was terrible. Like they're clustered. I know they sponsor all this stuff, but um, <laughs> they'll even admit the cluster stuff was terrible. And grid grid server, but but if you sign up for that and then you add twenty bucks on, you've got Cloudflare. Nice. We got time for one more. Uh, nobody's mentioned IP tables. So do you no. configure those automatically? Or what, how does that fit in your thinking? That's firewall. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, when you're blocking all those IPs. It's just when you're blocking those IPs, you can use that to block or NAT or send things else where all that can be done with IP tables, the losing IP chains. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean. It's on the network level versus doing it in HD access, which is on the Apache level. Yeah, my question is do you use them or do you use some other NAT, NAT tools? Uh, it all depends. But I use them, yeah. I yeah. love IP tables. So, great. to answer more succinctly at, at our work, we have a um, router with NAT stuff and, and firewalls that is our main device in front of all the servers. That's our main thing, but we are using IP tables on the servers also, because uh, I also want to reduce some of the traffic that's flying back and forth between the servers and control some of it, at least, um, which is not controlled by the router that sits in front of them. So it's, uh, in, in our case, it's a mix, but like 90 plus percent is at the router level that has a firewall built in. Like when he was asking about the clouds, uh, different usage of the cloud outside, I mean, almost automatically you have to go mess with IP tables on all the different Linux setups. Yeah. And and so it's like, is it, you know, that would be considered like kind of dedicated, although it's a cloud, right? Because you've got full control over that image. Yeah. So it's how you look at it virtually or not, or bare metal, or it's all. <laughs> it's know, all the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, there's one more issue that a lot of these guys aren't thinking about inherently because they think about being attacked. Quite often, if you watch the outgoing and notice when you were compromised, you would get that spammy snail thing into your box. So you really want to pay attention to what's going out. So if you start noticing an email going out like crazy, you know you're getting code. And so watch that. And so what we've done um, is our network device and our firewall device, we block certain outgoing stuff. 
big plan. So as soon as we see that outgoing traffic, we're like, holy shit, we need to compromise. Let's figure out what signal we need to get. That's that not worked out pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that. Well, no, no, they, they might put a different server on your box, right? So it's not necessarily a patch, I guess, compromise. But somewhere they compromise something. So what happens yeah. your email is going out because of spamming it, right? Or you're using something else. Yeah, that's that's a specific. I mean, another thing to look for is if, when you do like a what is it? A, 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 I forget. Look at the network traffic, the net, the connections that are going out. Sometimes you'll see uh, just a weird process that's connecting on port, some really weird port. It's not any like standards, not SSH, not uh, port 80, connecting to some IP. Usually that's like a relay to like a, a, a another another box. And, once things start flashing red and symbolic links don't match up, yeah. you know you've been... Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it goes back to what I said. Your web servers are choosy targets because they have really high bandwidth and are typically you know, fairly well endowed in terms of CPU. So they're much better than a zombie PC. And, and that's, that's precisely the sort of thing that you'll be seeing one way or another. Has anybody in here ever used Storix software? Storix? Nobody? No. Uh, okay, so it's like it, it looks at your configuration state. So it, it's an imaging software. So it's like if uh, Christoph's got like a solid state drives uh, and then he wants to move all this stuff to uh, a SCSI RAID like 10 and he's going from like one box to this and it's got a small drive to a big. It basically takes imaging, redoes Linux, and puts it back together on the other box. So if anything happens to this box, Within like 15 minutes, you can be back on this other box, and you oh. can store this from any place anywhere. Is that kind of like Blueprint? Is yeah, at Sage Tree, we started using Blueprint. Yeah, which yeah. does. Blueprint. But um, but that's it. basically configuration management at the code level. So it grabs config files, it grabs package descriptions, and all of these, and you it'll put. It's not imaging. It's it's config. Yeah, this is actually config. Under Git, actually. It's the same thing, right? Yeah. It's like it's kind of DD, but like pretty. Um, so. <laughs> So like this, uh, this thing watches your configuration state, and if it changes over so much time, you can set it for a threshold. Basically, say yeah, something's going on. Watch out for this box right here, and then it'll freak out. We we it saved it saved us a lot. Like uh, look for dot 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 slash whenever you're looking, <laughs> yeah. or or binaries. Yeah. Or find a dot dot dot. It's when we're joking. It's space. like there's, they'll build a virtual Linux, or they'll build a virtual world inside your servers. It's Pretty, wow. pretty fun stuff. <laughs> and that's and you can say like if you really get into it, then you start building honey pots and you can build. What's the software? Storix, S T O R I X. The guy was uh, wrote Sysback for IBM way back when and turned right. DD into a beautiful, usable model that can be restored from network tape, yeah. whatever. Everybody cool. runs on it. It's for AIX. <laughs> nice. All right. Um, Time's up. Thank up. you for coming Thank up. You. This was informative. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. yeah. Should have sat here.